Hey everybody and welcome back to my top 50 board games of all time. Uh, this is the final instalment of this series of videos and concludes from number 10 to number 1. So these are my absolute best of the best. So at number 10 I have Mombasa. Now Mombasa is um, a game that's new to this list. Um, I didn't play this one uh, last year. Um, it's a fantastic game with a lot of different things going on in it. It's by um, very prolific designer um, Alexander Pfister who I've not really played loads of his games, but what I have played I've really enjoyed. Um, so kind of I'm looking forward to exploring more of his games. But this one um, has some area control that goes into it as you were trying to um, colonize different areas of Africa. But the cool thing about this is that you don't kind of have a designated uh, color that you use to spread around. You actually invest in these different companies and increase your kind of shareholding in them in order to get more points at the end of the game. So if a company is really doing well by, you know, having a lot of map coverage, you can really focus on playing cards to increase your holding in that company to get more multipliers. Very, very clever. It also has this great card use system where you um, play cards into these different columns um, which kind of dictates the actions you can take for the turn but at the end of each round those columns slide up into your kind of three different discard piles and then at the end of the turn you choose to take one of those discard piles back into your hand. So you can really strategically play about which cards you want to use for upcoming rounds, you know which ones, you know, where to play where and so on. So everything matters in this game. Um, a brilliant game, there's some kind of a small amount of deck building that goes into it. Uh, it's a good hand management, you've got the area control, um, but it all comes together very nicely in a pretty uh, elegant package. Um, I think once you've got the rules kind of um, in your head and, and mastered, it plays very nicely, but really recommend this one. It's a great meaty game um, and I couldn't recommend it enough. That is Mombasa. At number nine, I have last year's number six with Concordia. Now Concordia is probably one of the most elegant games that I have in my collection. Um, considering how deep it is, it is one of the most streamlined things you'll play because all you do on your, card, on, your, on your turn is you play a card from your hand and everybody's got the same kind of series of cards and they all dictate an action you can take. Um, so all you do is you, said, you play one of those cards and do what it says and there's also a card that lets you pick up all the cards you've played back into your hand. But the cool thing about these cards is not only do they have a uh, kind of a unique ability on them, they also dictate your scoring at the, end of the, at the end of the game because it's a very opaque game where you do not know what other people are scoring because the cards in their hand kind of multiply um, points kind of dependent on your game state. So for example, if you have loads of money and you collect a certain type of card, then that will multiply the amount of money you have by the times of that cards, or maybe um, the regions you're in, or maybe the different types of cities you're in. Um, it's pretty, um, it has a great amount of player interaction for low confrontation. So what I mean, mean by that is that if people get into cities before you do, you have to pay a more expensive fee to get into them. When people activate certain regions, um, you also get kind of reap the benefits for the different cities that you're in as well in that region. So there's loads to think about, loads going on, um, a real tense kind of um, race to get those cards, uh, not only for the abilities, but also for the scoring criteria, but a real joy to play and just so uh, magnificently designed. That is Concordia. At number eight, I have another new game to the list with the Grand Austria Hotel. Now this is from Simone Luciani and um, Virginia Julie, who are two of my absolutely favorite designers ever. This game is an absolute joy to play. Um, I guess in its core, it's a, it's a dice drafting style game, but when you roll the dice, um, they are all allocated to a certain action. And then when you choose those actions, um, and the strength depends on the amount of dice allocated there. So you can really kind of focus on the stronger actions which have lots of dice there, or you can focus on or, or try and get to those uh, actions that are a bit more rare and that are probably gonna get snapped up because there's no opportunity opportunity to take them. Um, the game is very thematic because you recruit these different kind of um, guests into your hotel, you try to feed them and then you send them off to a room that you've previously prepared and get points that way. You also get kind of um, synergies or combinations of powers that these different guests give you. You've got these staff cards which are really powerful that you can play which give you kind of unique abilities and powers that no one else has. Um, just a brilliant game, loads of cool combinations, loads of great synergies and it's super fun for a euro and it always has kind of a light-hearted feel to it um, but still being extremely um, deep and uh, thinky that is grand austria hotel a, a magnificent game next i have 
Num number seven, I have last year's number seven with the Resistance Avalon. Uh, this is my undoubtedly my favourite social deduction game by a country mile. Um, I absolutely love this game. Uh, basically, it's a social deduction game, which means that there's going to be two different teams, um, but you're not going to know who's on what team. And then you're using kind of deduction to reason out who's on what team to try and wean them out and to complete quests if you're a good guy or kind of fail quests if you're a bad guy. Um, the social interaction in this game is absolutely out this world. I've had some of the most heated arguments in gaming while playing this game. Um, it really is emotional and it, it brings out a lot of kind of visceral feelings. And I just absolutely love what it, or what kind of feeling it gives. So much fun. It accommodates uh, a lot of players. I think the rules overhead are more than warranted for the, um, you know, for the, the fun and the, um, as I said, the interaction that you're going to get out of it. Um, for me, there is, this is like the best social deduction game. There is nothing else even in the league of it. Um, you know, there are some similar ones to it, but this one just takes the, uh, takes the biscuit. There is, a really interesting role where you know you've got the good team who are kind of servants of Arthur and the bad team who are minions of Mordred but on one of the on the good team there is Merlin who actually knows who all the bad guys are but if one of the bad guys the assassin finds out who Merlin is at the end of the game then the um the bad guys can still win that way so all the different roles just interact with each other so interestingly and are just so um or just the, the detail that goes into um, how they do interact and just the, the, the nuances of how you can play those characters to their best kind of potential is just sublime. So that is the Resistance Avalon. At number six, I have a game from this year with Trismegistus. Um, now this is um, a game by Danny Toshini, who probably is my favorite designer or um, at least in the top three. Um, he it made some of my absolute favorite games, but this one is undoubtedly probably his most heaviest and most involved game. It's another dice drafting game, but this one you have, um, all the dice are unique custom to the game and you are drafting them based on a number of different criteria. So you've got the symbols on the dice, you've got the color of the dice, and you've also got the number of dice in the pool as well, because that's gonna determine the amount of actions you can take with that dice. Um, you are essentially trying to manipulate your kind of board, which uh, um, is supposed to represent all different kind of materials, and you're trying to um, you know, spend the different potency to manipulate them to fulfill different potions. Um, you can get these artifacts, which give you um, really powerful bonuses and get a little engine built. Um, as I said there's a lot going on in this game, but uh, it just really clicked with me. I think a lot of people were kind of put off by its heaviness and involvement, um, but for me, it just absolutely just, just hit the spot. I adore it. Um, I've only played this a few times and it's already this high, so I imagine if I play it a few more, this could even break into my top five. I like it that much. Um, it actually plays in a relatively um, short amount of time. I think both times I played in about an hour and a half. And considering the amount of, of, of depth and decisions that go into it, that is just absolutely brilliant. Um, so much to think about, loads of different strategies, um, absolute brain burner, but again, I find that so interesting. And this one just is absolutely amazing. You've got to check it out. Don't be put off by the little niggles that people complain about, some of the graphic design and stuff like that. It's absolutely fine. There is no issues at all. And the game is just out of this world. That is Trist Magistus. At number five, I have another dice drafting game and another new one to the list with Coimbra. Uh, this uh, is by Virginio Gili and Flamina Brasini. Um, again, more Italian designers. This one um, is pretty much splitting hairs with Tris Magistus with me. Um, this one is pretty, well, it's quite light in comparison to that one because um, it's only two criteria you're basing your dice drafting on. That is the pips on it and the color. Um, but the cool thing about this one, if you're draft, drafting the dice with the higher pips, then you're going to get first dibs on these different cards you can buy. But also, um, you're going to have to pay more in order to, to take those dice. Um, also, the colour is important because all the different colours represent something different, such as points you're going to get, or money you're going to get, or, or movement you can use to move around the map to get different bonuses and stuff. Um, it's an absolute, uh, really nice looking game. I, I love the way it looks. It plays really smoothly. The engine building is so satisfying because you can really focus on things and make yourself so efficient in different actions that other players can't get. Um, I just really like this one. I can't say a bad word about it. Um, and yeah, it's just a sublime game. Definitely check this one out. That is Coimbra. Um, at number four, I have last year's number three with Zulkin, the Mayan calendar. Now this again is by Danny Toshini and Simone Luciani. Uh, this one is a worker placement game. Um, and 
if you watch my channel, you kind of might be aware that I, I'm a bit hit and miss with worker placement games. I, I kind of get a bit bored of your kind of standard place a worker here, get your resources in order to build something. Now this one is pretty much that, except this one has a huge kind of uniqueness to it because when you're placing workers down, you're placing them on these different gears. Um, and each round, those gears are shifting and moving up. And every time, or kind of the longer your workers are on these gears, the kind of more powerful um, rewards you get in return. So there's this real puzzle about when you're going to keep them on you're on the board, when you're going to take them off to get the power abilities. You've got to really weigh up in your mind the kind of timing of the game and um, be as efficient as possible because you might say, I'm going to put this uh, worker on here and let it just tick away. And by the time this worker gets here, I can pull him off and that one will be ready for me to pull that one off as well at the same time in order to be as kind of smooth as possible and to waste as little movement as possible. It is an absolutely geniusly designed game. Um, you've got your standard kind of build buildings and get points that way. But you've also got this different uh, different strategies you can go down in terms of increasing your kind of technology to make you better at things. Um, you know, your standard kind of Euro stuff, but just that unique gimmick, which it, I kind of hesitate to call it a gimmick because it's so pivotal to the game. It just makes this game stand out miles above the pack of the rest of worker placements. Um, yeah, that extra aspect of um, not only blocking spaces, but also, um, you know, having to factor in the time you're going to leave them on the gears is just amazing. Um, yeah, a top, top quality game. That is Sulkin the Mayan Calendar. At number three, I have last year's number 11. So this is quite a jump up for this one, which is Trajan uh, by Stefan Feld. Um, now, this is my favourite Feld game by a pretty uh, big margin, and I like all those games, so that's really saying something. Uh, this one is, um, the, the kind of pivotal mechanic in it is the Mancala wheel, where you are placing these different, um, different wooden pawns on these different bowls, and you are basically picking one of these stacks up in these bowls and dropping one off at a time, and depending on which one you bowl you land in is the action you take. Um, and the game is essentially made up of all these different mini games that synergize with each other. But not only is that kind of puzzle of when you're going to pick up these different blocks and all these different cubes and put them in these different bowls to get the action matters, the colours of those different cubes are important as well because you can get additional benefits by lining up the colours to, to suit those tiles and get really powerful synergies. And you can, um, you know, this is a game that you can play so, or to such a brain burnering kind of capacity or you can kind of just chill out and kind of play it as you like but the best player is always going to win this game because the the degree of planning that you can put into it is just phenomenal it really is extraordinary um, you know you can plan just a couple of turns ahead or you can really think far ahead and just plan your turns down to a t in order to do what you want to do um, there's fierce competition for the different tiles you want um, this kind of set collection bonuses you can get and there's tracks you can climb up um, there's cool kind of set collect other additional set collection things you can do in terms of collecting cards and stuff like that um, but yeah this is a, an absolute masterpiece of a game and um, the more I play it the more I enjoy it and funnily enough for a game that I've never even won this game um, it's still one of my favorites and I've played this quite a few times so that's a real sign for a good game for me is a game that you keep on losing but you still want to play again and again that is Trajan by Stefan Feld uh, phenomenal at number two I have another new game to the list and it's another worker placement game by um, Virgilio Gini and Flaminia Brasini with Lorenzo Il Magnifico. Now this is, uh, as I said, it's another worker placement game and it's essentially um, an engine building game. This has the biggest, most satisfying um, engine building in a board game that I've ever seen as you accumulate these different cards by placing the workers and adding them to your tableau. And you can, there's a particular spot on the board you can go to which activates all your cards in your tableau and just gets you a huge kind of influx of, um, of different resources that you can use to buy additional cards and stuff like that. Um, as I said, the engine building is just out of this world. It's, the things that you can achieve in this are just mind-blowing. Um, you've got unique powers you can focus on. You've got set collection you can focus on. Um, the expansion for this adds a whole new dimension as you get a new, new column of cards you can draft and also unique player powers. The worker placement itself is unique because um, each of your workers has a different colour and at the beginning of the game or each round you roll the dice which relating to that colour which determines the strength of those workers. But that not only matters for you, it matters for everybody. So if you roll particularly badly um, and have a strength of one for all your workers, then everybody's stuck with that. And then it's kind of your kind of fault if you haven't, um, you know, mitigated that or prepared for it. 
Um, and you can kind of invest in um, servants, which kind of bolster your strength by one and in order to kind of in improve your worker strength. But yeah, this one is so much fun. I absolutely love it. Um, I said the engine building is where it really shines for me. Um, and yeah, there are so many things to explore, so many card synergies. Um, and honestly, I cannot say a bad word about it. It is that good. This is Lorenzo Il Magnifico. And finally, at number one, which last year's number two, and funnily enough, the year before that, it was number two as well, is El Grande. Now, El Grande is uh, a game that's actually, I think it's more than 25 years old now. Um, it's by Wolfgang Kramer. Um, it's an area majority style game set in Spain where you are playing cards to um, determine initiative order. And then you are using those cards to have first dibs on these different action cards that you can play, which manipulate the board state by placing cubes or moving cubes, or you can place cubes in a tower, which kind of is another kind of majority you can do. Um, it, it really is such a smooth and elegant game for the amount of player interaction. It's pretty fierce in the way that you, you know, you have to fight over these spots, but at the same time, um, it doesn't feel needlessly confrontational. You know, that if you want to win the game, you have to, you, you have to kind of stand on other players and try to push them out of the way. Um, if you don't, then you're just going to get trounced. Um, just knowing how much to commit to different locations, knowing when to hold back and let, let them go to other people, um, it is just an absolute masterpiece. Um, as I said, it's been my number two for the last two years, and this year it's just held its own um, and just squeaked that number one place. But that being said, you know, my top kind of three or, or four, I guess, um, there really is splitting hairs in between what I'm going to put number one. Uh, but this one, I think just considering its kind of longevity and the amount of times I've played it um, and just kind of how good it's stuck around, it's just giving it the number one spot this time. It takes about an hour and a half um, spot on, but that time really does fly by when you play it. Um, you lose yourself in it. You have to be careful about watching what other people do on their turn um, because it's always going to affect what you're going to do. Um, the card play is so clever because, as you said, if you want to play the most powerful card to get the card you want, then you aren't going to kind of take more of your caballeros, which are like your, your work or your kind of um, your markers that control the different areas into your pool that you can deploy. So you've got to have that kind of influx of playing low cards and knowing when to play them in order to get more caballeros or knowing when to play the high cards to get the card you want, but sacrifice not getting more caballeros to your pool. Um, that push and pull mechanic just works extremely well. The, it has this really great uh, mechanism where the, um, I forgot what it's called now, but there's basically this huge pawn on the game and it kind of blocks all players in and out. Oh, sorry, it's called the king. Sorry, I should have rem remembered that. Um, the king goes on the board and it kind of locks a certain region out and no players can go in or out of that region and it gives additional points. Um, also, you can only ever deploy new workers or new caballeros to areas surrounding where that king is, which again is a huge tactical decision where to put it. And yeah, this game is, uh, again, a masterpiece. Um, and I don't use that word kind of, you know, flippantly. It's just that good of a game. And I think maybe if you introduce this to new board gamers, they'd probably think, you know, it's okay. But the more you play it, and maybe the more you kind of explore this hobby, you appreciate how good of a design, design this is. But again, I could talk about this all day, but I'll let you try it out for yourself if you haven't yet. But yeah, a truly phenomenal game. That is El Grande. So that concludes um, my 2019 top 50 board games of all time. Um, I'll do this again next year. Five new games in my top 10. Um, so that kind of shows the quality games I've played this year. And it'll be so interesting to see if next year um, I'm playing games of this quality that will kick some of these games out of my top 10. So I hope you've enjoyed the review or the video. Please hit like and subscribe if you have and subscribe to my channel. Um, for everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye.